Hello, good morning, everybody. Do you hear me well? Yes. We can hear you. Yeah, thanks. So thanks so much, Tess, and all of you for organizing such an amazing event for so many people joining. Uh, I'll do my best to do an overview on perhaps not the what is best known because you know your ex your patients that you're experts at the same time. So I try to pick up. Uh, things that I thought that would be of interest to you. I don't know what this, this is a green line here. It's not supposed to be there. I don't know what is it. Well, I know if you don't see it, great. Uh, but if you see it, it's not, it does not belong to my slides. Okay, um, I will start focusing on diagnosis here. Um, uh, apology. Sorry. Yes. To Rosa, there is the slide looks like it's cropped on the edges. Could you, uh, on the left hand side, let me. We can see it now. Perhaps without. It might be better without if you enlarge it. Thank you. Like this. Mm hmm. Yes, we can okay. see it now. Okay. Uh, so nowadays, the recommendation is not to screen children because there is not currently an approved therapy. But what is advised is to check their blood pressure uh, in every visit to the pediatrician. But for at risk adults, and uh, yes, the recommendation is to screen for the disease. Uh, because uh, the potentials of presymptomatic testing usually outweighs the, the risk or the, 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 the liabilities. And it's mostly performed by ultrasound. In the absence of other findings to suggest a different cystic disease, a patient with bilateral and large kidneys and many, many cysts uh, has, likely has ADPKD, especially if the patient has cysts in the liver and so uh, there are no doubts in this case, even if it's a, a, a spontaneous mutation. I mean, if, they, if the patient has no ancestors with the disease. But what regarding to newborns and children uh, with cyst? Um, this comprises the heterogeneous diagnostic group of cystic disorders. And uh, we strongly encourage a specialized consultation because there may be other genes involved or that may be a severe case of PKD in children, which is infrequent, very infrequent, fortunately, but, but should, uh, should be followed up by a pediatric nephrologist in that case. Um, what about molecular genetic testing? I guess if, it, if the cause was like um, doing a, 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 an ultrasound, everybody will have a genetic test. But because it's not that it's not available everywhere, so there are some recommendations um, to be considered. Um, for many cases, knowing that mutation does not add too much uh, to that single patient. So there are some considerations. Cases of equivocal or atypical renal imaging findings. That means an ultrasound or MRI is not supportive enough of the diagnosis. We have doubts and we request uh, a, a genetic testing. When, is, when there is marked discordant diseases within the family, that meaning uh, some extremely severely affected and a very mild affected one uh, that you don't know whether that patient has the disease or on the other side, if the severely affected one, extremely severely affected has something else. Then very mild PKD that we may doubt where, whether it is PKD or not. Uh, sporadic PKD with no family history I mentioned before that some cases have extremely large kidneys with liver cyst, uh, kidney failure, and in these cases, even if it's sporadic, uh, there are no doubts about the diagnosis. But in many cases, not knowing, if, not having a family history may, may, may point to the need of a genetic test. I already mentioned the early and severe PKD cases, these children. And then uh, PKD with syndromic features. That means um, with uh, other um, 
symptoms um, like abnormalities in the fingers or eyes or ears or heart or whatever. And finally, for reproductive counseling, this is uh, essential if some uh, if an affected patient wants to have an unaffected um, offspring, then they should undergo some techniques like prenatal diagnosis or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Um, this always should be included in the discussion of reproductive choices with a patient with ADPKD, although I acknowledge that it's not widely available and it's not covered everywhere, but um, I probably it should. That varies from country to country. Uh, what about ma making a diagnosis when there is no family history of ADPKD? I already mentioned that when the, when, when the clinical um, features and the ultrasound is very, very suggestive, there is no doubt. But because simple cysts are not that rare in the population, look, uh, over six, 70 years of age, 22% of the population has cysts and 9% have bilateral. And this increases a lot if the patient has chronic kidney disease for any other reason. So uh, it is important the number of cysts, the fact that a patient with polycystic kidney disease never reaches uh, kidney failure without enlarged kidneys. So having cysts in the kidneys and renal failure without big kidneys, that does not happen. So we should look for another renal disease accompanied by cysts. And the presence of liver cysts is also extremely um, important and suggestive of PKD. The location, cortical cysts are more frequent the malaria ones in PKD, at least in early stages, uh, the presence of hypertension and large kidneys. Now I would like to raise um, something rather new. I would like to make you understand this concept, which is mosaicism. You know that here in Barcelona, we have the Gaudi mosaics, which uh, are formed by different pieces, different colors, same for cats with different colors and from plants having more than one color. Then imagine that one of these colors is the one that carries the disease, cells with the disease. And the other one, for example, here with, um, with uh, this tree, the almond tree, uh, the other one has not the disease or the cells I draw you here. PKD1 in red having the disease and the other ones not having the disease. So you can imagine how having just a, a, a small amount of cells in your body with the disease, that will cause a milder disease, right? It won't be as severe as having all the cells with the disease. So this situation will, um, will cause a less affected individual. And why not all cells have the disease? Well, that happens because the mutation is not contained in the sperm or the egg of the, of the parent of that individual, but it appears in the embryo, in a single cell of the embryo. And all the cells derived from a single cell have the mutation. And this is why not all cells in the body carry the mutation. That can also happen with germ cells, germline cells being uh, eggs or sperm. Maybe not all of them have the mutation in these situations. Eh? Again, when the embryo suffers a mutation in one of the cells. When I say embryo, I'm meaning with very few cells, like uh, three, four, five cells. All, all cells derived from that one will have the mutation. So imagine we have a male a man with mutations in half of their sperm. He may have no signs of disease because he may be a mosaic with very, very low uh, sign, sign, symptoms, but, but he may have two affected uh, kids, which is very unexpected because this one would say, I'm a sporadic case, but then another one is born. 
So this is very infrequent. I mean, do not okay, worry know. about that. Yeah. But this is something <laughs> that, that should be bared in mind. And is also the cause why a parent may be extremely mildly affected with very few cells with a mutation. But um, there are uh, sperm cells with the mutation. And then the, if this sperm, uh, I have a, I, a background noise, a translation in French, I think, that I'm listening to, sorry. So if this sperm with a mutation um, gives rise to a baby, all the cells of that baby will have the mutation and then he will be severely affected. Uh, I, I listen again to background translation. Sorry, and, Rosa, and, we're just trying to sort that out. Yeah, yeah sorry. So uh, this is a very interesting work by Catherine Hope and collaborators where they, with, by using next generation sequencing, you know, this is a technique we use nowadays, they found that around 10% of patients with a negative family history and negative genetic testing by classical Sanger sequencing, they are mosaics. Right? Next generation sequencing, the technique we use nowadays, detects more easily, much more easily, mosaics than um, it, it used to do the traditional Sanger sequencing. So a uh, significant percent, I mean significant like 1%, but it's not, it's not, uh, yeah, forgivable, yeah. Move, I move now to an easier concept of PKV and sorry about this concept of mosaicism, but yeah, I thought that it was interesting sharing it with you. So management of hypertension, you, I think you all know that renin angiotensin um, blockers are the first choice for hypertension in polycystic kidney disease, meaning, meaning all that drugs that finish with sartan on pril, like an alapril, losartan, and all their relatives. Of course, always with a restriction in sodium in the diet. There are no clear indications for second line or third line drugs. Um, to highlight what has been known in the recent years from the whole trials, that for patients younger than 50 with normal renal function, that doesn't mean for everybody, just for younger than 50 with normal renal function, <clears throat> the aim of blood pressure should be below 11, uh, 110, 75. As I mentioned before, it is recommended for all children from affected parents to have their blood pressure taken. And um, uh, regarding the treatment, um, Dalila will expand on that, but again, the, the renin angiotensin system blockade is the preferred first line uh, treatment. I will now go briefly through extra, mani extra renal manifestations of PKD, just a few of them. Liver cyst, I think that will be addressed late, later on. Um, there, it doesn't cause serious complications, but the symptoms related to liver cyst uh, are huge, I mean, back pain, flank pain, abdominal fullness, discomfort, all this is a, a big deal and a, a big burden for patients with huge livers. So there are some um, treatments. Um, I would say that the ones in the middle are quite risky, complicated, and with uh, side effects sometimes, but uh, still there are some, some treatments that will be reviewed later on. Okay, and what about intracranial aneurysms? To date, and waiting for the new uh, key DBO guidelines, it is not routinely uh, recommended to screen for intracranial aneurysms. But if you look at the indications, family history of uh, cerebral ble bleeding, bleeding uh, previous intracranial aneurysm rupture, high risk professions. And if you add that patient anxiety, despite adequate information, that means that 
in my opinion, everybody who has a concern of having an intracranial aneurysm could have an MRI, which is without gadolinium. That means that you can have that done even if you have a very low GFR or even if you're transplanted, dialysis, whatever. So if it is a concern for you, I, I, would, I would do that. Because why? Because there is, there is an approach, there is management for that. And there's no point to, to, to check probably uh, things that you cannot do anything, but in this case, there are options. So uh, it's good to do that. And uh, also a negative result doesn't mean that you cannot have it ne no, never in your life. So the recommendation is to rescreen at five, 10 years intervals. And how is it treated? We can have um, coils inside. I mean, this is endovascular without opening your cranium. The second one is opening the cranium, the brain, and, and then clipping this aneurysm. The third one is uh, a stent in, with, with uh, artery, uh, artery and then uh, coils in it. And the, the last one is a flow diverter therapy with, with uh, a stent. And what are the features of rupture intracranial aneurysms in PKD uh, from cords? Well, the mean age is like 40, so it, it does not correlate well with kidney function, even 10% below 20 years of age. 50% of patients have normal creatinine, again, um, reassuring that it's not related to CKD. 30% were normal tensive, meaning that hypertension is a factor that increases the risk. And of course, the risk of rupture is present be, depending on the size of the aneurysm, having multiple aneurysms also, and having relatives with, with aneurysms. And now I'll move, and that will be um, the more important part of my talk, to the progression of PKD. And did this had some animations? Let me try at least, otherwise I won't see what is below. Yes, um, the kidney uh, enlarges a long time, as you well know, and the kidney function remains stable for a long period of time, even with increasing kidneys, till it reaches the point that renal function declines. This is the means decline of GFR, which is very useful to follow up patients at this stage. And here, the only thing we have to follow up and to see how the disease progresses is to measure total kidney volume. Fortunately, and with help of patients, agencies, and, and experts, in 2015, the FDA and the EMA made a positive um, assumption saying that TKV in combination with patient age and GFR was a prognostic biomarker. That was extremely helpful because as physicians, we, it, we don't think it makes much sense to treat someone who's close here very late in the course of the disease. Um, so we would be very happy to treat as soon as possible. Thus, can I keep with this uh, screen mode or should I go back to the previous one? It looks fine, Rosa. Okay, thanks. So this is how different kidney disease progresses. We have very common diseases like FSGS, IgA, nephropathy. These are proteinuric diseases. Proteinuric diseases progress very quickly compared to diseases that do not cause significant proteinuria, which is the case of PKD. And this is why you can have PKD for a long period of your life without any trouble. And then when we have these enlarged kidneys that barely can lead with all the function, all the work that the kidneys are supposed to do, then there is a decrease in kidney function, which is quite steep uh, in, in some cases with PKD mutation, especially the truncating, so steep that is comparable with what happens with type two diabetes. 
So um, stable for a long period of time and then decrease. Then if we, if we join this knowledge with what we know from the drug we have available nowadays, which is tolaptan, as you all know, based on the trials in the Tempo 3, 4 and the reprise, we see that the sooner we start treatment, the larger effect we get. And if we start late, the effect is very mild. These are, of course, um, prediction. It's not real life because we have we had no time to have patients on treatment for such a long period of time. But especially because, as all you as you know, when a patient is on tolaptan, you cannot tell the effect for that that single patient. It has been studied for the cohorts. Uh, for the clinical trials, but in a single patient, you cannot tell because the kidney function will decrease less than expected without treatment and the kidneys will increase less than expected without treatment. But to really assess the effect, you should have like an exact twin without treatment, then you will be able to compare. Otherwise, okay, you can say that's progressing less than expected, but is an assumption. It's not um, real science or precise, I would say. Anyway, what we are sure is that an early intervention will obtain better outcomes, and we need to identify these young rapid progressors. There are uh, predictions, um, factors influencing progression, which are clinical, for example, having macroscopic hematuria, early onset hypertension, early decrease in GFR, of course, that is easy to understand that will have an impact on the disease. Also some unhealthy situations like obesity, ex um, very large caffeine intake, because now it's kind of agreed that one, two coffees a day, it's not, it's not harmful. So high protein intake, uh, the kidneys have to work a lot when they receive a high protein intake. So avoid uh, extra proteins or eating too much uh, red meat and protein. Low water intake is also not nice for, for you, as you know, and smoking either. And then we have imaging predictors, genetic predictors, and lab predictors that we will focus a little bit on them. First of all, I would like to share with you this thought. When someone has a genetic condition, which is serious, and by serious, I mean very early onset, the weight of that effect of the gene is huge. And it doesn't mean that you cannot do anything, but there is not much to be done. And for example, this is the case of a patient, this patient four, and the, the white boxes stand for the genetic effect. With a truncating PKD1 mutation, the genetic uh, damage is huge. And then, of course, there are other factors like environmental effects, other genetic effects, somatic changes, um, way of life, all this. But the effect is little. When compared, especially to a very mild missense to PKD2 mutation, that the patient may reach end stage disease um, very late in life, even never. So if this is the case, th these uh, things that I mentioned, smoking and not obesity, not having diabetes, not having a hypertension, all this is uh, very important, but it's only because the patient is older and the more um, aggression he receives, the, the, the worse that will go. So this is important. Mm -hmm the effect of other factors than gene effect depending on the, on the severity of the mutation. And well, as you know, the FDA as well as the EMA have approved GENARC, different name in the US than in Europe, uh, for adults so far. With um, In Europe, uh, from CKD 1 to 4, there are no restrictions on CKD stage at US. 
but for rapidly progressing patients. And this uh, is kind of a nightmare because we do not want each physician to decide if his patient is a rapid progressor. So uh, what is rapid progression? For example, the uh, era EDTA, by the way, we changed the name and from this week, it's not EDTA anymore. It's ERA, new ERA, European Renal Association. Uh, so the ERA uh, delivers some guidelines that are outdated now, but the idea was interesting. The mean age of going into dialysis or transplantation in Europe for the PK, for PKD patients is 58 years. So we decided that the, if the prediction um, resulted in going into the, the dialysis before 58 years, that meant the patient, the patient was a rapid progressor. In the US, they suggest something similar, 50 to 75% percentile of the overall PKD population reaching end stage kidney disease. And um, in Spain, we try to, uh, to, 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 to move a little bit uh, later that and to do it before the mean age of dialysis for patients in general, which is 65 years. But how do we assess that? How do we assess if that single patient will need dialysis before that age or around that age? Well, we have object objective data, which is retrospective total kidney volume by MRI, but it's usually not available. And it's always, it's also, um, it may be confusing because uh, imagine that big cyst, if it ruptures, then next year, the kidney will be much smaller and, and it won't be because the disease has, um, has improved. The retrospective GFR decline, it is useful, but um, it varies a lot, especially in CKD1 and 2. So you need a, a lot of years to check that. And, and, and the worst is that GFR remains stable at early stages. Remember the plot, um, like being stable for many, many years. So all these years that probably uh, treating the patient will make a huge effect in delaying end-stage kidney disease. Uh, because they have no renal failure, we cannot assess that. So it's not useful for early diagnosis of rapid progression. We have the imaging tools, the imaging uh, predictors. Uh, we know how well, how, how helpful it was that a huge effort from the US researchers on the CRISP trial, when they showed that the, the, the growth of the kidneys was exponential, it was variable between patients, it was relatively constant, unique to each patient, and it averaged 5% per year. And there was a very clear uh, correlation between increase in total kidney volume and decrease in glomerular filtrator, filtration rate, GFR, kidney function. And what, it, what was very interesting, uh, it was used for the clinical trials with, the, with Tovapton and other trials was the baseline GF, um, total kidney volume, uh, which was very nicely correlated with, um, with, the, um, with uh, what was going to happen eight years after. So baseline total kidney volume being an, a good predictor of, of what will, will happen. And you all uh, know or heard about the Mayo class, the Mayo classification, which uh, gives uh, you a class, a risk class for progression, depending on the volume of the, of the kidneys, uh, your age, your height. And of course, class E is the worst and class A is the, is the milder and class C, D and E are considered the rapid progression classes. This is uh, how it works. This is uh, the, the website. And um, these are the inputs you put in it. And these are the outputs you get. And I just would be very careful about approximations on GFR because, uh, I mean, there are a lot of factors influencing it. And it's uh, quite risky to, to use or to truly or completely trust these uh, approximations on when you will reach uh, CKD free or dialysis. Also, um, none of the techniques is, is um, 
perfect. For example, here we have uh, patients with um, myoclasis and we have patients with high myoclasis, uh, theoretically rapid progressors who have extremely good renal function. On the other hand, we have uh, those with advanced, um, uh, with very mild myoclasis and very low GFR. So there are some outliers here. What about uh, renal diameter? This is something very easy to measure, very cheap. And uh, it's variable. I mean, it's not a precise thing, especially if the kidneys are over 17. Uh, but uh, this that came from, uh, from um, the Bhutani article, in patients less than 45 years with a kidney length over 6.5, these patients are likely uh, to be rapid progressors. And um, we checked that in a cohort and we saw that it had high sensitivity and specificity uh, compared to myoclast. But, but the, the, drawback, the drawback what it was that it was frequently unavailable uh, because age or lack of ultrasound or, or whatever. Uh, we also tested the use of ultrasound to assess myoclast because um, MRI in some places is not easily acceptable or it is um, accessible, sorry, or it is expensive. And we tested and we saw that it, it performed very well for um, class, classes A, B, and E, I mean the extreme ones for very mildly affected or very severely affected, but it was not reliable at all for the, the B and C classes. So ultrasound may select patients for MRI. Uh, so summary for imaging, total kidney volume is well established, reliable, and probably the Mayo class is the best single prediction tool. There are no other non-TKB imaging markers that I'm not going in depth into them. And the ultrasound is, has a low resolution, but it's cheap and accessible. CT shouldn't be used. Unless, at least frequently, because it, it has radiation and MRI resonance would be the gold standard. And now we move very quickly to lab testing. We have urine biomarkers. Um, for example, urine to plasma ratio, MCP1, beta dose microglobulin, proteomic PKD score, microRNAs and proteins in urinary extracellular vesicles. All these are. Um, is research, but it's very promising. And maybe one day we will be able with just a sample of your urine to determine whether you would be a rapid progressor, hopefully. Has some drawbacks, um, the reproducibility, the storage of these samples, and they all need to be tested in large cohorts. Um, regarding plasma testing, there are blood biomark biomarkers like GFR decline, copeptin, uh, super, it's also being tested and, and promising also. And the, all these blood biomarkers are hampered by the renal clearance of these uh, metabolites, which is very dependent on the function of the kidney. So they're promising but need to be tested in large cohorts. And finally, genetic testing, I'm not going in depth into that, just to say you that even the the records of your family give you a very good idea of what can happen to you. There are very uh, there are families with extreme discordances, like 12% of families show extreme discordances, and, and up to 30% of families show extreme discordances when more than five families have reached end-stage kidney disease. So this is a concern from the clinical point of view because we cannot rely too much on the family history. And um, we published that many, many years ago, but it's still true. And uh, regarding the mutations, as Emily will tell us, uh, there is a very nice correlation, genotype phenotype correlation for cohorts for a large number of patients. And that correlates pretty well with the Mayo class. But when we analyze single patients, we see many outliers, meaning patients that although, for example, having a PKD truncating mutation do very well, and other patients with a PKD2, PKD2 mutation doing very poorly. So in, in a study we, we did, um, we, we showed that I, we, 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 uh, we could see that the pro-PKD 
uh, is highly specific, but has low sensitivity, uh, meaning that many rapid progressors do not have symptoms before 35 years of age, which is one of the, of the um, what is requested in the propagating. But when it is positive, it is for sure very, very specific. So what are my thoughts on genetic predictors? They perform much better in cores at that individual level. It's not recommended to determine progression based on a genotype alone. I mean, that helps, but not alone. It may be perfectly part of a composite predictor tool. And the family history may suggest rapid progression, but won't be enough it's by itself. This is the old era. I should put the new logo, but sorry, because it's new from two days ago. And uh, this is outdated. New one is uh, going to be delivered. This is the recommendations from, from the, the US where they completely untrust the Mayo class. And these are the recommendations in Spain, like treating till 60 years instead of 50. That was the previous uh, European recommendations and from 30, um, from 30, a GFR of 30. And for this subgroup from 55 to 60, we request less than 60 of GFR. Um, but, and the rapid progression treat criteria using main class or propagate. But our advice is always perform uh, MRI when um, starting treatment. And that's all, uh, risk assessment is evolving, it's an evolving process. Uh, there is a large dis the dispersion and the rate of disease uh, between patients also in the same family. The Mayo imaging tool is probably the best single tool. The ERA um, algorithm is outdated. The gene-based testing is reliable in groups, but in not that much in individual patients. And all data should be evaluated in real life. So thank you very much for attention. So I'd be extremely happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Rosa. That was an uh, excellent start of our day. We do have some questions in the Q&A. In fact, there's the, the one at the top, if you can see this, is yeah. in Italian. If you could read it out in English, okay. please, and answer in English, then the translators can translate. Uh, good morning, I'm a patient and um, and I have frequent infections by E. coli and infections in the bladder. Um, um, he's taking cyprofloxacin. He's 50, 57 years of age. Um, he's an, his, kidney te, uh, his blood test shown a 1.6 of creatinine and a clearance a GFR of 40. Um. There was I an, don't see the question. Yes, uh, there was another question. Sorry, um, uh, the person was asking if there is a better, more efficient way to deal with this infection either okay. than taking ciprofloxacin. Thank you. Yeah, well, ciprofloxacin, you know, we, we, we like to keep ciprofloxacin for really tough infections, skin infections more than bladder infections. So if the, if the, if the E. coli is not resistant, um, there are other drugs uh, like phosphomycin, for example, that is being taken um, two doses, just uh, three days apart, and that is very efficient. And it's, it's very, uh, very directic and very specific for the urine without going into the, the body. So if it's sensitive, uh, I would like to, to change that to, I would advise to change Cypro to to phosphomycin or other antibiotics less less strong because otherwise the if you take a lot of cypro for um, bladder infections when it gets the day that you have a kidney infection hopefully not but if, if that day arrives then you may have a resistant e coli to cypro so try not to use these strong antibiotics for small things um, are there studies on epigenetics? Uh, I would say there's something going on, but not really nothing ready to, to give you some data or, or any advice or whatever, not, not much. 
Perhaps Emily might uh, answer that. Yeah, sure. There is a question from Rome. Uh, good morning from Rome. I am the only one in my family who have this condition. I, sorry. And I discovered I have this disease in 2006. And since then, I have repeated many genetic tests found to be negative on the genetic test. And consequently, I cannot access the drug tool button. In the near future, will it be possible to access a similar drug without having to have this genetic response? Thousand thanks. Well, uh, unfortunately, genetic testing is not um, positive in 100% of patients, but um, in 90 something. So the first thing I would be concerned is that if you do not have family ancestors with the disease, um, you should be really, really sure it is PKD. It can be, I mean, it can be, yeah, but uh, at least you have to have, if you're considered to baptism, it means that disease is quite severe. Otherwise, if you do not have a large kidneys, you're not thinking of tobaptin or any other uh, disease, I eat drug. Then if you reach that point, you probably, probably you should have hepatic cyst, a hypertension, that could help. And uh, I don't know, but I haven't, I'm not sure there is absolutely compulsory to have the genetic test positive to receive tolvaptan. If the clinical diagnosis is completely sure, in my opinion, that would be enough. But it may, that may depend on countries again. Uh, well, a lot of questions from a single person that uh, tolvaptan, is it a consolidative therapy? Well, it is a proof therapy, it's the only one we have. It exerts an effect and um, yeah, I would say it's consolidative. I know the Italian Drugs Agency is still monitoring it. Well, you know, monitoring in terms of side effects, there are thousands and thousands of patients all around the world taking the drug. So we are um, still happier than we were with the clinical trial. So in that sense, it's not a big deal. And regarding effect, no matter if you monitor it, that if it's not a randomized clinical trial, you won't be able to see any effects. So um, I think we should trust the medical agencies uh, approving the drug and that's it. Uh, apart from the liver, what other risks are there in this kind of therapy? Not many, really. Liver and, and uh, dehydration if you're not taking enough drinking, but that's, that's, all, that's all. Uh, let me try to answer all oh, those very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can say for protein intake, the evidence is not really very strong in the first part of the ADPKD life, considering the nice study performed in the Netherlands. Salt, but not protein intake, is associated with accelerated disease the progression in ADPKD. Absolutely true. Um, I, I strongly believe that that salt, uh, reducing salt intake from early stages, is very important because hypertension is really damaging. And I always recommend to have a healthy diet. Not nothing special, nothing particular. Having everything and and just avoiding have extremely fatty diet or extreme, I mean, not extremes, having everything. But when there is kidney failure, then yes, um, the, the protein could be decreased. Yes, sure. Um, there's a patient from Spain uh, taking tolvaptan for the last four years. Now she's 30, 39 uh, with uh, creatinine normal 1.1, 1.2. He was the first three years with at the highest dose of tobaptan, for a, but this last year um, he she decreased the dose because she's drinking too much and her nephrologist believes that with the lowest is sufficient will be equally effective. Well, you, that is a big issue. Um, we don't know in the clinical trials. Uh, we aim for the higher dose, and this is how they were designed. Um, there are also suggestions saying that if the urine osmolarity is below 280, that works and that would be enough. So that could be a way to check urine osmolality. And, but definitely 
if, if the, the 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 urine output is extreme and it it it, it, it impedes your clinical I to your daily life, then you could decrease. I, I don't think that makes a huge difference to be in the middle of high dose, but uh, that also depends on, on osmolarity in urine. <laughs> it says, that is interesting. Can rapid progression in a parent be inherited by a child or is it individual? Well, it again goes into that uh, subject of intrafamiliar variability. How alike look different members of a single family. Um, families look more similar between themselves than compared to other families. But even though I told you that like 30% of members, 30% of families have extreme phenotypes. I mean, very different ages of onset of end stage kidney disease. So if you're a rapid progressor, you probably have a PKD1 truncating mutation, and then you some uh, will have that mutation. Uh, he has high chances of also being a rapid progressor. But as I shown, there are patients that even having this mutation do pretty well. So we cannot tell completely. Uh, why do many have kidney failure in menopause? Can it possibly be related to estrogen dominance? Probably not, probably it's related to age. Yeah, menopause, you know, we know is at, at that age, it, 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 it's a coincidence, I would say. Uh, question about aneurysm. My mom has an ADP, is an ADPK patient and passed away at the age of 52 due to an aneurysm. They told me it wasn't anything to do with the disease. But now I see that aneurysm are at risk, so maybe it's better to test me for a head aneurysm, definitely. Yes, you should. You should definitely. When you have a family history, you should. Um, um, yeah, there's a patient from Italy without family history of the disease. Uh, he has a genetic test positive and his daughter has not, uh, has a genetic test negative. There is something here that I cannot see. Okay, um, and has no, no symptoms. Okay, can her children have the disease? No, because the disease never skips generations. And that's easy to understand. You have something and you pass this to your daughter, then she can pass it to her children. But if you have this, but you have this also, it doesn't have the disease, and you pass the, the healthy, gene to your daughter, then she has nothing to give. She has no mutation. So there is no way, no way she can pass the mutation to her offspring. So PKD does not skip generations. There is one in German that if anyone wants to translate, I'd be happy to take. Uh, there is one about estrogens in menopause. Well, that has an impact mainly in liver cyst. So if you, have, if you have a huge liver, uh, they, they are not recommended, but not for kidney function. I think, yeah. Rosa, it's Tess, uh, we're just on uh, 1046. So if I can suggest we stop the question and answer now. And thank you. The, uh, we hope to answer questions that are unanswered later. Okay, thank you very much. So it's my, uh, so I'd like to warmly thank Dr. Tora, oh, you disappeared already, for such a fantastic talk. Thank you. And to wish you well for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you so thank much, you. Rosa. Thank you, Tess.